2000, and they were all shouting in unison, Owens, Owens, and Owens. Here's the snap, the ball is down, Dipsy kicks, it's on the way! Hello, I'm Chris Collinsworth, and welcome to the Record Breakers of Sport. You know, when you think about it, record keeping has always been the yardstick of sport. It's the way we measure the abilities of one athlete against another. This show is about those athletes who set the standards. People like Babe Ruth and Wayne Gretzky and Billie Jean King. We'll also recognize that sometimes breaking barriers is more noteworthy than breaking records. For instance, we might not know who holds the current world record for the mile, but most of us remember that Roger Bannister was the first man to break four minutes. There are some records that take a lifetime to achieve, others that take only a few minutes or even a few seconds, but they all have one thing in common. They're set by people who for a period of time did something faster, farther, or more often than anyone had ever done it before. Human record breaking is inevitable and the human spirit is indomitable. I believe that if there are records to be broken, someone somewhere will try to break them. And in order to do that, he or she will make sacrifices. For England's Roger Bannister, sacrifice meant postponing his study of medicine at Oxford University, to train instead to be the world's first sub four minute miler. I knew that uh, it was possible to run a four minute mile. My knowledge of physiology indicated that there was no reason why somebody could run a mile in four minutes and one second and not in um, three minutes and 59 seconds. So I knew it was possible and the barrier was a more a of a psychological barrier than a real physical barrier. Bannister had flirted with breaking the four minute mark on several occasions. So on May 6, 1954, at the Ifley Road track at Oxford, he was well prepared. In order to break a record like the four-minute mile, it was necessary to make sure that the laps were even laps, because to run too fast in one part and too slow in another is inefficient. I was able to set my mind perfectly for the attempt, and I don't believe there was any inefficiency in the way in which I managed to release the total amount of energy that I could. I knew that provided I could then keep going and run on my own uh, without my legs uh, failing, I had broken the four minute mile. Bannister had accomplished his goal, running a mile in three minutes, 59.4 seconds. There would, however, be little time for him to rest on his laurels. Just seven weeks later, Australian John Landy, here number 300, who himself had been chasing the four minute mark, broke it setting a new world record in the process. Landy and Bannister would then meet at the British Commonwealth Games of 1954. Bannister would emerge victorious in what would turn out to be his last race before turning his attention to his medical studies with no regrets. You can never relive the past. All you can say about athletic records is that at the time, Pavo Nermi was superior to other runners. Emil Zatopek, at his day, was superior to other runners. And I'd like to think that for a brief period in time, I was able to defeat my own rivals. That's quite enough. Jesse was uh, class. Uh, he had the same sort of style that a Joe DiMaggio has. Uh, he ran effortlessly, and that was the single most important aspect of Jesse Owens as a track athlete. And when I ran against him and was beaten by Jesse regularly, it wasn't as though uh, he was pulling ahead by force of energy. It was just as though he was on an escalator going up and away, and I was not on the escalator. He was that smooth. That smooth and that good as evidenced by Jesse's achievements on a record-setting day in 1935. 
Carver, Michigan, and here's Movie Tone's exclusive camera record of Jesse Owens' most spectacular moments in the Big Ten meet. In the 100-yard dash, the colored star of Ohio State, second from left, flashes to the tape to tie the world record of nine and four-tenths seconds. The running broad jump, watch this. Owens smashes a world record with a leap of 26 feet, eight and a quarter inches. The crowd sees track history in the making. When one person in one day in one track meet sets three world's records, utterly unbelievable. For me, one of the most outstanding achievements by Jesse was setting those three world's records in three different categories, in three different disciplines. He did it as a sprinter, as a long jumper, and as a hurdler. It was almost incomprehensible to other athletes at that time and to the rest of the sports world. When Owens traveled overseas to Berlin to compete in the 1936 Olympics in front of Adolf Hitler, his track and field accomplishments in the States were already well documented. But what Jesse did in Berlin on the world stage in front of a disbelieving audience that had come to see Aryan supremacy was truly heart-stopping. Until now, these people had just heard of Jesse Owen's feats. Now they were seeing them in person, and they were indeed inspiring. Owen simply dominated the Berlin Games, along the way collecting a record four gold medals. The competition was grand, and we're very glad to come out on top. Thank you very kindly. A stunned Hitler refused to offer Owen's congratulations, but it was different for the German people. People just loved the guy. When he came come in the stadium and begin warming up a bit, you could hear the crowd of 120,000 shouting, Oh, Vens, oh, Vens, oh, Vens, the W in German, you know, it pronounces a V. And they were all shouting in unison, Owens, Owens. The games sometimes are referred to as the Nazi Olympics. I think of them as the Jesse Owens Olympics. There is also more to the Jesse Owens story than medals. Acutely aware of Germany's admitted anti-Semitism, Owens offered to step down from the 4x100 relay to make room for his Jewish teammates. Jesse Owens said, Coach, let Marty and Sam run. They deserve it. I'm tired. I've won my three gold medals. Let them run. And the coach, in this case it was Dean Cromwell, pointed his finger at him and said, You'll do as you're told. Owens started off the relay and led the Americans to their expected triumph. It was his fourth gold medal, and it put him in the record books. But to think that he was willing to give it up to make a point should tell you something about the kind of man Jesse Owens was. Jesse was more than a record breaker. Jesse was a model for all Americans, black or white. His demeanor, his attitude, his performance, his conduct throughout his lifetime was uh, something that all of us should emulate because he was that kind of a person. He was terrific. Jesse Owens was probably the greatest athlete of his time. But today, all his records have either been equaled or surpassed. What that tells us is that record setting and record breaking are often just a product of the times. Still, throughout sports history, there have been those athletes who have accomplished feats that we admire for their perennial greatness. And here we are, back in 1924. Pavo Nermi, the flying fin, has just glazed his name in great Olympic headlines. So he comes to America for a nationwide assault on the record. In his first trial against a squad of American Indians, Nermi runs the mile in 4 minutes, 12 seconds flat. The doctors examine him. 4 minutes, 12 seconds, the man is a freak. Pavo Nermi was not a freak, just the greatest long-distance runner of all time. Throughout his career, he set 29 world records. The legendary Bobby Jones was equally impressive in the world of golf. In 1930, Jones won both the U.S. and British Open and Amateur Championships, becoming the only player to win golf's Grand Slam. In tennis, the Grand Slam has been achieved several times, but no one conquered all four tournaments at a younger age than American Maureen Connolly, who entered the record books in 1953 at the age of 18. But if you want to talk young, how about Boris Becker? In 1985, he turned the tennis world upside down. 
Let's look at the belly flopper. He's the all-time belly bouncer around here, but he outdoes himself. Around here was Wimbledon, where the 17-year-old Becker became the youngest men's singles champion in tournament history to take his place among the grand achievers. On his way towards becoming the heavyweight champion of the world, Mike Tyson often thought back on the words of wisdom he received from his trainer and guardian, the late Cus D'Amato. I've been um, always discussing this with Cus ever since I was 13 years old about, wow, it'd be great to have the belt. And I used to always see the old time fighters and I used to look at these guys and I used to say, God, these guys are immortal. And Cus has always told me, tell me they weren't born that way, they became that way. So Tyson too set out to make himself immortal. But unlike the idols he revered as a kid, Iron Mike planned to get there a whole lot quicker. The power in his young hands was enormous, and his rise to the top of the heavyweight ranks was swift. If I was to win a title at 20 years old, that's a mortality. Fighters, mostly in the heavyweight division, mature and bloom too late. They late bloomers, and it would never happen. When they're 19 years old, they're, they're fighting four rounds and six round preliminaries. There would be no six round preliminaries for Mike Tyson. At the age of 20, he would become the youngest heavyweight champion in boxing history. I was coming to destroy and win the heavyweight championship of the world, which I've done. And I'd like to dedicate my fight to my great guardian, Customato. And I'm, I'm sure he's up there and he's looking and he's talking to all the great fighters and saying his boy did it. I know records are made to be broken, but it will never be broken. I think sometimes when you know you have a record, it's really an unbelievable feeling. It's very intangible though. It's like something you can't touch. I'm very proud of it. I also know that it'll probably only last for a fleeting moment, but I also know that, that others are going to look at that record and aspire to be better than that record. In Billie Jean King's case, that record is her 20 Wimbledon titles. It all started in 1961 when she won the doubles championship. But even when she captured the singles title for the first time in 1966, Billie Jean still didn't foresee the future. That was the start of something that I had no idea was going to happen. When I was growing up, I didn't really think about records very much. We had so much going on politically in tennis that my thoughts were always to the big picture. If I were a youngster today playing, I'm sure I'd be very different. I would want to just break all the records and I could have time to look in the record books and think about it. If you did take time to think about it, you'd realize just how special a player Billie Jean King must have been. In between all that time she spent as a crusader for equality for women in sports, Billie Jean just kept on winning Wimbledon championships. When she was through playing, she had won six singles titles, the last and most satisfying coming in a year when many thought her career was over. Nineteen seventy-five. No one gave me any chance to win the title. That probably meant the most to me because I probably invested the most time, emotionally, mentally, and physically I'd ever had to try to win a singles title. Ironically, it was a doubles crown with Martina Navratilova that gave Billie Jean the record. The year was 1979, and King needed just one more Wimbledon championship to break the tie of 19 she jointly held with Elizabeth Ryan. Twentieth title, and one wonders whether it will ever be beaten. Six singles, ten doubles, and four mixed. I know that someone will break my record. I hope it makes everyone do better. And I, I like that. I like that feeling that maybe the next generation will have to do that much better. I've passed that on to them. When I first hoisted the, the trophy, it was, uh, it was incredible. I, mean, uh, I broke down. I mean, I couldn't help it. 
It was a dream come true that I had been working for for a long time. And uh, you couldn't just wish to win, you had to do it. The first time Martina Navratilova won at Wimbledon was 1978. That year, she defeated her arch rival Chris Evert to collect her first championship plate. A year later, Martina would win again. But after that, it wouldn't be until 1982 that she would stand triumphant at center court once more. It was a spot Martina would get used to, as she would win the title for the next six years to tie Helen Wills Moody's record of eight Wimbledon singles championships. That's it. That eighth win came in 1987 over Steffi Graf, who was herself becoming the game's new dominant player. Graf's development prompted Martina to recruit Billie Jean King to help her with her mental approach when she went for her record ninth win in 1990. I had prepared very well, and, uh, and Billie Jean knew how to do that. I didn't let the occasion overwhelm me, and that was because I've done my homework, and maybe I would never have as good a chance as I did this time, so I really wanted to grab it. I didn't want to get away. After losing to Graf the previous two years, Martina had to be happy to see someone other than Steffi staring at her across the net. As things turned out, Zena Garrison gave Martina very little trouble. The title was hers. Her record ninth win, a grand achievement. I was proud of myself. I can pat myself on the back. There are a lot of people behind me that have made it possible, and I would like to thank all of them. I'm absolutely savoring it and will do so for the rest of my life. It's uh, something that I had worked for for a long time, and I think that's why it means so much more, because I had to wait for it, I had to work for it, and it paid off. There have been countless other records that at one time or another people thought were untouchable like the lifetime records that were set by some of the most famous athletes in history. In the early 1900s, Ty Cobb was one of baseball's most illustrious characters. He was rough and tough and even had a reputation for stealing. Bases, that is. In 1915, Ty stole 96 of them, a standard which lasted 47 years. Then players like Maury Wills and Lou Brock came along. In 1962, Will swiped 104 bases in a single season, a record he held until 1974. That's when Brock knocked Maury out of the record books. He stole 118 bases and later went on to top Cobb's all-time mark. But even Brock soon found his record broken. The culprit was Ricky Henderson, who successfully stole 130 bases in 1983 and as a result still holds baseball's all-time single season stolen base record. Scoring the most points in basketball is somewhat like getting the most hits in baseball and for decades that honor belonged to Ty Cobb. Now however it belongs to Pete Rose because like most records that were made to be broken Cobbs eventually fell too. set a new standard, a new record made to be broken. There have been many outstanding running backs in NFL history, but perhaps none had as much impact on the game and its record book as Jim Brown. These guys are great for what they had and what they did. I know that I've had the greatest performance of any back based upon uh, everything that one can do in a certain period of time, but uh, you cannot go around saying you are the greatest and if you're the greatest, are you the greatest forever? Are you the greatest for that day? I don't really need that. And I don't rely upon what people tell me about what I did. I know what I did and I know what I didn't do. More than anything else, what Jim Brown did was to establish a work ethic that the NFL's other great backs have always strived to live up to. I have to battle guys weighing 260 pounds that's trying to take my head off. And that's a battle of physicality and will. And uh, if you're not a warrior, they're going to break you. you know, it's the closest thing to war that I know without shooting guns. But since I had a few weapons to utilize, it was just a part of the game. There are times when you get hit with tremendous force. But you weren't afraid of that. You were afraid of not succeeding in what you were trying to do. Jim Brown's success could be seen in his career and single season rushing records. And even though he was often maligned for being a loner, there was a purpose to his plan. 
You have to be isolated to come and together all of your forces to be able to perform your individual uh, task. And as a star of the team, there was great expectation of me. A lot of times when people criticize me or try to hurt me, it makes me stronger because I take that and I run it through my system and then I throw it back at them. And that force is awesome. Awesome enough in Brown's case to be the NFL's all-time leading rusher when he retired in 1965. I'm proud to have performed on a certain level starting in the 50s when racism was flourishing. I was proud to maintain my dignity and my freedom under those circumstances and to deal with the physicality, emotionalism, and the mental aspect of it and to be able to leave at a time when no one thought I should and never to come back. I'm proud of all of that. Brown, too, should be proud of the legacy he left behind for running backs like O.J. Simpson to challenge. O.J. was unbelievable, you know, world-class sprinter speed, very strong shoulders, great cutting ability. No doubt about it, one of the top five backs that ever lived. I had great admiration for his ability. And see, each back has something that another back doesn't have. I didn't have O.J.'s speed. I had a fourth gear. O.J. had a great fourth gear. O.J. running left. O.J. 5-4. Maybe six. Maybe six. Maybe six. Maybe six. I just wonder if the three of us at this moment fully realize what it has been our great privilege to watch O.J. Simpson run for 2,000 yards in one season. Since records are made to be broken, it was inevitable that someone like Walter Payton would eventually catch Jim Brown and run right by him. They might have played in different times with a different set of obstacles, but for Payton and Brown, the results were often the same. Walter Payton's determination is very similar to mine. Walter Payton is more acrobatic than me. I like him, he's a warrior, you know, and he was a great, great player. Second play of the second half for the 21-yard line. Walter needs two to break the record. High formation. Quick pitch to Walter. Looking for the record. Cuts back. He's got it. He's out of it at 25 to the 26-yard line. Walter Payton becomes the National Football League all-time leading rusher as they're passing Jim Brown on his second carry here in the second half. And that's the equivalent to Hank Aaron breaking Babe Ruth's all-time home run record. Just as Peyton passed Brown, someday someone might even pass Peyton. And that someone could very well be Eric Dickerson, the holder of the NFL's single season rushing mark. Eric Dickerson is very beautiful in his style because God gave him tremendous ability. He doesn't have the heart of Walter Peyton. Everybody don't have the same heart, but he'll be known for his talent. Every back is different and they fit into their own categories. And the beauty of it is that it's so unique in that sense. Everybody is special, and I think the thing that they have to do is go in themselves and bring it out. If somebody scored 50 goals a year, it would take him, uh, let me see, take him 20 years to catch up to what I've done. He was known as Mr. Hockey, and what Gordy Howe did was establish career and single season scoring records that by all indications should have lasted forever. In his heyday with the Detroit Red Wings, no other player could live up to Howe's strength, endurance, and ability. Although Gordy prefers to spread around the reasons for his success. I think I was very fortunate. Some of my records and some of the longevity was always built around some talent. Hockey players make things a little easier for you. If you're out on your own by the limb, you know, and you do all the work yourself, you're in trouble. When he was on the ice, Gordy never seemed to be in any trouble. More likely, he was causing it. He wore the Red Wings jersey for an astounding 26 seasons, accumulating the most goals and assists in NHL history when he retired in 1971. Then at age 45, Gordy gave hockey another chance when he reluctantly signed with the Houston Arrows of the World Hockey Association to play with his two sons. I thought it was a mistake, but the determination and playing with Marty Mark, I did not want to fail. And I said, I'd, I'd done the little extra things. Uh, when I found out I was going to play, I started running the hills around, around Michigan. 
In 1979, Gordy went back to the NHL to tangle with players half his age. I was hit one time, and, uh, and one of the young guys that hit me said, I'm sorry, Mr. Howell. You know, it's, it's, so I looked at him, don't worry. He said, worry about your job, don't worry about me. With his career finally winding down, Gordy accomplished something no other hockey player had ever come close to. He scored his 1,000th career goal. Anytime somebody's chasing your record, you must have done something right. And I got a lot of records out there they'll be chasing for a few years. Yet, and, and they're all going to be broken. And, uh, and I don't feel bad about that. I just, uh, I feel like Jesse Owens. Every time somebody chases your record, every four years I'm reborn again. Wayne Gretzky, the great one, has become the greatest of them all. The leading scorer in the history of the National Hockey League. It took him only 10 seasons to accomplish what Gordie Howe did in 26. But Wayne Gretzky has indeed rewritten hockey's record books. The great one has set a new standard of performance at a level nobody would have believed possible, especially Gordie Howe. Hockey was on a little bit of a, a downslide before Wayne came along. But he looked like a skinny little guy, you know. He said, boy, somebody could feed him and get him healthy. But uh, there's a lot of strength hidden in that thinness. He's a phenomenal young man as well as a great athlete. Wayne now owns nearly every single season NHL scoring mark, including the one for most goals, which he set in 1982. That year, Gretzky went on to score 92 goals. Stanley Cups followed, and after a change of uniform, so did the NHL's all-time career scoring mark, which he set in 1989. To go in the game, low, clear to the blue line, held in by Duchesne. Duchesne's pass in deep to Taylor, to Gretzky, he scores! He's done it! You look back and they said nobody had touched Rockets records, and then they said, oh, nobody had touched my records, and uh, he didn't touch them, he smashed them. <laughs> he went right on by. I think he's going to build it up to a point, unless something, rules are changed in the game of hockey, nobody should even touch him. Will someone catch Wayne Gretzky? Only time will tell. Meanwhile, the great one keeps right on going, rewriting the record book every chance he gets. Now here's a guy who knew how to set records, Babe Ruth, baseball's biggest attraction in the 1920s. You see, after the 1919 scandal, why they, people stayed away from baseball in droves. And then Ruth started to hit home runs. When he hit the ball, they were majestic. Oh, he did things that were unbelievable. There was nothing like Ruth ever in this business. You know, we would go to Cleveland or some town like that, and uh, it would say, Babe Ruth arrived in town today with 24 other ball players. <laughs> the Babe was a giant of a man, the idol of an entire generation. Well, bet you hit a lot of home runs. Well, I won't predict anything, but I'll sure do my best. I hope all you boys will be out there watching us. There was nothing quite like watching Babe Ruth's powerful swing. Throughout his raucous career, the Sultan of Swat accounted for 714 home runs including a single season record of 60 in 1927. He dominated the game like no other player before or since, yet even the Babes' home run records would eventually fall. The man responsible for breaking the single season mark was Roger Maris. The year was 1961, and amid controversy over the length of Maris's season, he would hit his 61st homer on the final day of the year. Here's the windup. Fastball hits deep to right. thought about athletes you know I always wanted to play some type of sport you know one thing that I always felt like my mother never worried about me when seven or eight o'clock come when dusk came because she either could find me in the front room or out somewhere playing baseball in the majors the best place to find Hank Aaron was running around the bases because he could sure hit home runs 
a quiet and unassuming man. In his day, Hammer and Hank might not have gotten the attention of a Willie Mays or a Mickey Mantle, but he was the one who would eventually catch Babe Ruth. I realized that I was not in a media town like New York or Chicago, and I was never going to get the press that some of these guys here got. But I said, now, you know, when you're second best, you try a little bit harder to reach the top. I said, now, this thing is within my reach, uh, and if I stay healthy, there's nothing going to stand in my way that I can't get it, you know. So that's what I did. 3-1 pitch. There's a drive into left field. That ball is going, going, and out of here. Henry Aaron has just tied Babe Ruth. There were times that I thought that, now, when you hit this home run, you ought to go around on your knees and crawl around the bases. You know, I'd do some silly thing, and I said, no, nah, no, nah, yeah, that would be putting on something. You know, you got to do the same thing that you've been doing all these years, you know. But I did feel, I, I really felt full inside. I felt like just somebody could just take a needle and punch me in, and I, all the air would let out of me. I would fly to the sky, you know. <laughs> Aaron's joy, however, was tempered by those who didn't want him to break Ruth's record. He even received hate mail and death threats that were racially motivated. That hurt me very much. It was, should have been the most enjoyable time of my life, and yet it was probably one of the most horrified times of my life. I was just only trying to play baseball and bring a little enjoyment to some, some, some kids or maybe to a family. In the 21st season of his marvelous career, Aaron would pass Ruth on April 8th, 1974. He's sitting on 7-14. Here's the pitch by Downing. Swinging. There's a drive into left center field. That ball is going to be out of here. It's gone. It's 7-15. There's a new home run champion of all time, and it's Henry Aaron. I felt really proud of myself because I finally had reached the top of my plateau. I had reached the top as far as I could go in baseball. That was absolutely nothing else that I could accomplish. You know, I surpassed the record that people said could never, nobody could ever surpass. So I felt very proud of myself. In sports, you have to take the good with the bad. I know. I've played in two Super Bowls and lost them both. It's the same with records. For instance, did you know that the guy who shares the record for hitting the most home runs in a World Series game is the same guy who holds baseball's all-time record for striking out. It's true, and the sports world is filled with records people would probably like to forget, but we're not gonna let them. This notorious group will always be remembered as the Heartbreakers. I'm sure that Jim Marshall of the Minnesota Vikings is proud to hold the National Football League record for consecutive games played. I'm equally sure he's not proud of another record he holds. One he set in 1964, the most yards run the wrong way with a fumble. 30 yard line, Kilmer driving for the first down, loses the football. It's picked up by Jim Marshall, who's running the wrong way. Marshall is running the wrong way, and he's running it into the end zone the wrong way. Thinks he scored a touchdown, he scored a safety. I wouldn't worry about it too much, Jim. You had a wonderful career. And come to think of it, you could have been in Don Baylor's shoes. In his baseball lifetime, Baylor was hit by a pitch a record 244 times, including 28 in 1977 alone. Ouch. I can sure think of better ways to make a living. But I've got to tell you, boxing isn't one of them. WBC super lightweight champion of the world, Julio. Sensei Chavez, the current IBF junior welterweight champion of the world, Meldrick Taylor. Check this out. On March 17, 1990, those two fighters destroyed each other for 12 rounds. The cards would later show that up to the last round, Taylor was ahead on points until he walked into a right hand and disaster. If he gets up, he probably wins the fight. As if getting hit all night wasn't bad enough, Taylor lost the fight he would have won with only two seconds left. The latest knockout ever in a championship fight. Now 
Now here's a guy who had a different sort of knockout punch, Reggie Jackson, the home run hitting outfielder whose titanic blast knocked the lights out of many an opponent. In his career, Reggie hit 563 homers to rank sixth on the all-time list. But it's where Reggie ranks on another list that gets him on this list of heartbreaking records. See, Reggie struck out 2,597 times in 21 seasons, and that happens to be an astounding 661 more times than the next most whippable player. Ah, oh, but Reggie was always a good sport about things, wasn't he? Good, however, is not an adjective that could be used to describe the Tampa Bay Bucks of 1976. Unless, of course, you wanted to use good for nothing. That, by the way, was how many games the Bucks won that year. None. In fact, after losing all 14 games in 1976, the Bucks went on to lose 12 more the next year, establishing an NFL record in futility. In the futile efforts catch your fancy, we offer you Tommy John. Three errors on one play. Don't you think there should be some sort of penalty for that? And speaking of penalties, how about Dave Schultz, who set the NHL record for most penalty minutes in a single season? But the time Schultz spent in the penalty box must have seemed like a vacation if you compared it to the time Casey Stengel spent in the dugout with the 62 Mets. And it's been outstanding the way every player on this team is put out in this spring training camp. And if you can continue that way the rest of your life, you're all going to be successful in baseball. Talk about misguided statements. Casey Stengel sure didn't know his players very well. In 1962, his New York Mets were decidedly unsuccessful, losing a record 120 games. Well, at least the Mets were entertaining, especially the old professor himself. As soon as the kid can talk, he starts to say Metsy, Metsy, not Papa, not Mama, Metsy, Metsy, Metsy. So that's what they are. They're now singing the kids Metsy, Metsy, Metsy. See, when they want food and everything. So the babies are even started. We got them from four years on. We got them from 10 years on, 15 years on, 18 years on. Casey was sure in the league by himself. Just like some of the records that have remained unchallenged for years. They're the kind of records that seemed incredible enough at the time, but it's their longevity that has made them all the more remarkable. And while nothing in life or sport is ever a certainty, you have to wonder if some of these records just might stand forever. It's conceivable that Nolan Ryan's strikeout records will one day be topped. Conceivable, but that too is highly unlikely. Ryan holds both baseball single season and career strikeout marks. At one point, there was doubt that anyone would strike out more batters than the legendary Walter Johnson. But Ryan eased by him and every other pitcher, too, on his way towards fanning more than 5,000 batters in his career. Then there's the matter of no hitters. Ryan has thrown six of them, two more than any other major league pitcher. Actually, the Miami Dolphins do hold one NFL record that can never be broken, only tied. In 1972, the Dolphins rolled through the regular season and the playoffs, winning every game they played to finish with a perfect 17-0 record. Now that the NFL has expanded its season, a team may win more games, but none will ever have a better winning percentage than the 72 Dolphins. Such word as can't was developed to me by my father. Uh, and he taught it to me the hard way. Every time I'd say I can't, he'd thump me up the side of the head, like you thump a watermelon to find out if it's ripe. And he'd say, there's no such word as can't. He says, uh, you may have to do it differently than someone else, but you can do it. In Tom Dempsey's case, doing it meant kicking field goals for the New Orleans Saints. It was a remarkable achievement for a man born without a right hand or toes on his right foot. But Dempsey not only survived as a kicker in the NFL, he excelled. 
and would eventually kick the ball farther than any other man in the history of professional football. Tom Dempsey will have tried to kick the longest field goal in National League history. I thought I could make the kick. I was young, strong, and stupid at that time. You know, so I, I thought I could kick the ball. In fact, I knew I could kick the ball 60, 65 yards. The, the only question is whether I could kick it straight 63 yards. Scarpetti will hold. Here's a snap. The ball is down. Dempsey kicks it all the way. took weeks or months to really settle in because, you know, being young, all I could think of after I kicked it was, are we going to have a party tonight? The stadium is wild! Dempsey is being mobbed! Dempsey with a 63-yard field goal! The longest field goal in the history of the National League! That's the epitome to set an NFL record. You know, there's so many great players went before me and have come after me that to hold a record is, you know, got to be a great feeling. Today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. With perhaps the most famous words ever spoken in sports, Lou Gehrig said goodbye to baseball. Gehrig was a phenomenal player, the premier first baseman of his day. He was known as the Iron Horse and played in a record 2,130 consecutive games until a rare and fatal disease forced him out of the Yankee lineup. Often overshadowed by Babe Ruth on the field, Gehrig's remarkable streak has yet to be seriously challenged and remains to this day one of baseball's landmark records. The day he was honored at Yankee Stadium is now part of the fabric of the game and the laurels he received, a haunting tribute to a man who set baseball's most enduring record. I know Lou's gonna keep that stiff upper lip and he's gonna keep on going. And baseball is leading, and I think he'll stay in there. Another great Yankee famous for a record that may never be broken is Joe DiMaggio. His now legendary consecutive game hitting streak began innocently enough on May 15, 1941, and continued throughout the summer. Game after game, DiMaggio would get a hit. Before long, he had broken Wee Willie Keeler's record, and then kept right on going. The pressure was enormous, but time after time the Yankee Clipper would come through with a hit when his streak was on the line. It was a testament to his will and concentration. Ultimately, DiMaggio's streak reached 56 games before he was finally stopped. Joe, on behalf of Fox Movie Tone News and the ball fans all over the country, I want to congratulate you on breaking that record. Thanks a lot, Paul. In the years since, only one other player has hit in even more than 40 consecutive games. A big reason to believe that Joe D's record may never be broken. When Bob Beeman was growing up, the only thing that kept him out of jail was his grandmother's promise to a judge that she would keep him in line. She encouraged Bob to participate in sports, and it was through that competition that Bob Beeman channeled his emotions and achieved goals that would far exceed his expectations. Right after the Olympics was over in 64, I was preparing myself uh, on a daily basis to, to make the team. But I really didn't think uh, that I would really be the number one person at the time. All I wanted to do was to collect the suitcase, some of the Olympic hats, the memorabilia. I just wanted to be a part of this dream. At the time, Beeman's competition included Lynn Davies of Great Britain, the 1964 Olympic gold medal winner and world record holder Igor Taro Venetian of the Soviet Union. They'd all meet at the 68 Olympics, along with America's premier jumper, who actually became Beeman's ally. I had to be as great as Ralph Boston or better. And by working with him on a daily basis, I became a much better athlete if not from a physical standpoint, but from an emotional standpoint, because he was a very fierce person. He had this motivation and dedication to the sport, which rubbed off on me. Whether it was Boston's positive attitude or not, something surely rubbed off on Bob Beeman as he prepared for the single most dramatic moment in Olympic history. I felt very peaceful and calm. Uh, as a matter of fact, my body was never more relaxed. And, uh, when they called my name, I was ready. I felt 
There was no sound, there was no people talking. Even though there were a lot of people yelling and screaming, I just felt that I was alone. I said to myself that this is going to be my day. When Bob Beeman finally landed, he had broken the existing world record by nearly two feet. His jump was astounding, and his mark of 29 feet, two and a half inches is perhaps the most miraculous record in sports history. I just put it all together on the uh, podium where we were receiving our awards. And I remember my grandmother really saying to me that I'm going to do my best to the judge to to keep them straight. That wasn't in vain. I moved on, I said, I moved on to the highest achievement that any individual could ever receive in amateur sports, and that is to be the gold medal winner at the Olympic Games. I think what made Bob Beeman's jump so astounding was that he was able to jump so much farther than anyone had before. Perhaps, though, all Bob Beeman really did was delay the inevitable. While we say records may never be broken, we're also aware that as Yogi Berra once said, you should never say never. In fact, records are meant to be broken. And as long as there are goals to be reached and standards to be topped, athletes will try to do so. I can't tell you if we'll be around to see the next Martina Navratilova or Mark Spitz, but I can tell you with a reasonable amount of certainty, they will eventually come. And then the next generation of record keepers can wonder whether or not someone will come along to break their records. For the Record Breakers of Sport, I'm Chris Collinsworth. Thanks for watching. the kid can talk, he starts to say Messi, Messi, not Papa, not Mama, Messi, Messi, Messi. So that's what they are. They're now singing the kids, Messi, 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 see where they want food and everything. So the babies are even started. We got them from four years on, we got them from 10 years on, 15 years on.